I often say that the concepts of reliability and validity are among the most confusing terms in qualitative research, and here I'll explain them in under five minutes. So in short, reliability refers to replicability of the findings and validity is about trustworthiness of the findings. In qualitative research, uh, the concept of reliability is not that relevant simply because you cannot really replicate the findings. If you give the same data set to three different researchers, their findings are likely to be at least a little bit different. So so instead, qualitative researchers rely on the concept of validity, which is, as I said, all about trustworthiness and credibility. So uh, whether I can trust your findings, whether I can trust that what you found, what you think you found is actually what you found. Can I trust you that either deliberately or not, you did not impose your views onto your participants, either when you were developing your interview questions or conducting the interview, or maybe at the process of data analysis, that you did not impose your expectations and, and what you found is more about what you thought or hoped to find than what your participants actually meant. So in other words, uh, validity in qualitative research is essentially about reducing different forms of bias. And uh, although there are different terminologies and different templates for this, I like uh, Robson's uh, six strategies for uh, reducing bias and increasing validity, to which I also like to add my own strategy. I'll do that at the end of this video. So let's start with prolonged involvement, which refers to the length of your involvement in the study. It may be granted, for example, by the duration of the study or by you belonging to the community that you're studying. And being a member of this community or even being a friend to one of your participants may be a great advantage to your study and it increases the level of trust between you and the participants. And once this level of trust is higher, the possibility that the findings are valid is also higher because this means that the participants were uh, more likely to be, for example, honest and straightforward when they were talking to you. Another concept is triangulation. I'm sure you at least heard this term. Uh, before is quite a big one. There are different forms of triangulation as well. So there could be triangulation of data. So you're uh, collecting data from different sources, for example, from interviews, focus groups, and, and diaries or observations. There can be methodological uh, triangulation. So you're combining quantitative and qualitative methods in a, in a mixed mix methods research study. Or there could be triangulation of theory at the stage of data analysis. So you're bringing, you're drawing from different theories when you're uh, looking at your own findings. In any form, triangulation is known to be very effective in reducing uh, different forms of bias and increasing validity of your findings. Now, another strategy is peer debriefing, and it refers to uh, having your, your findings or your study evaluated by uh, experienced peer researchers. And now this may uh, sound a little bit overwhelming or intimidating. You may be wondering where to find these peer researchers, but actually very often it's an almost natural element of your involvement of being a student at a university. So you do have access to peers and their feedback. And this access can be granted by the different opportunities to present and discuss your research at its different stages, either at internally organized events at the university, like student presentations, workshops, or external conferences. These events will help you assess the study from a more objective and critical perspective and recognize and address its limitations. So it's a very, very valuable and effective form of, incre uh, of reducing uh, researcher bias and increasing validity of your findings. Now, another strategy, member checking, may also take uh, a variety of different forms, but essentially it's about testing your findings with your participants. Uh, it may, for example, include what is known as member checking interview or a validation interview, where you're meeting your participants for the second time just to talk about your emerging findings or your interpretations of the first uh, interview data. In its more common forms, a member checking may involve you sending the interview transcripts to your participants, or in the most common and the easiest, I would say, and probably the most powerful and effective form, member checking involves you just reaching out to your participants, either through text or email or, or messenger or whatever, and asking them to clarify some meaning. So for example, as I'm, as I'm analyzing the data from an interview from participant A, I may reach out to her and ask her before making a conclusion about what I think she meant when she said this or that, I may ask her, is this what you meant? Am I right in, in thinking that you were referring to this or that topic? So basically, before jumping in conclusions, you just want to talk to your participants and see if that's 
what in fact they meant. And this reduces researcher bias, reduces the bias stemming from your own assumptions about your data. Now another one is negative case analysis. I do have a whole video about this, but essentially negative case analysis is about analyzing uh, the cases or the participants uh, that do not really match the emerging trend, the trend that starts to, or pattern that starts to emerge and run through the remaining data. So whenever you see something like that, do not panic, do not try to hide it or conceal it because actually exploring these differences will help your study. It's very common that uh, novice researchers feel like it will damage their, uh, destroy their theory or their findings. Whereas in, in practice, it's good to know and understand these extreme or negative cases. And very often, by understanding this person who is so much different from the rest of participants, we actually gain a better understanding of why the rest of the participants are the same or similar. So definitely worth exploring these negative or extreme cases. And the final strategy on Robson's list is uh, called audit trail, and it refers to keeping record of all the uh, research related activities. Uh, keeping uh, transcripts, keeping uh, all the coding, all the files, uh, keeping some kind of a codebook or researcher journal. So basically, uh, the idea is here that if somebody didn't trust your findings and they asked you to provide some evidence, you can you can throw all these papers and documents and folders at them. This does, doesn't happen, by the way, so don't worry about that uh, actually happening. But in theory, that's what it's used for. Again, I often say when I teach my students uh, in vivo, I often tell them to keep these different folders in NVivo with all your different stages of coding, again, for the purpose of uh, keeping this audit trail, so the record of how your coding developed. And finally, as I said at the beginning, another strategy that I personally like to add and something I teach all my students is to be very detailed in your analysis. Of course, it had to be, it had to do with data analysis, but it's true and I always encourage being very detailed in your coding, whether it's line by line or paragraph by paragraph or sentence by sentence. The point is that you want to be detailed and you want your codes to be descriptive. Uh, I talk uh, about this specifically in this video that I want you to watch now because in this video I talk about creating high quality codes and by this I mean being very detailed and thorough in your coding. And this in my opinion is also one of the key and the most powerful and effective ways to increase validity of your findings.